everyone, and welcome to The New Yorkers. I'm Shireen Bhan, and we're in conversation with Ruchu Sharma. Ruchu, thanks very much for joining us here in New sure. York. Well, it's a spectacular view. Is the view on India equally spectacular today? Well, I think that the problem on India currently is that you cannot find a single bear on India. Mm. And uh, from a contrarian standpoint, it slightly concerns you because there's no, you know, like, there's no one who sort of has an pessimistic view within the portfolio management community, at right. least, that uh, everyone's very optimistic. Uh, and there's a sort of blue skies scenario that this is one of the few countries where economic growth is bound to accelerate at a time when most emerging markets growth rates is still disappointing. Mm. Uh, so the fundamentals do look quite good for India. Mm. The only problem is that how much is in the price because uh, sentiment also does seem quite uh, extended on India on a relative basis. So do you believe that valuations are looking stretched given the fact that we've already seen such a significant rally in the markets? Well, you know, Valuations is a very poor guide for mm. calling market tops and bottoms. It really is. And an and even poorer guide uh, to sort of try and predict when a 10, 20% correction can happen. So we do have Mr. Modi in the Prime Minister's office. He's saying the right things. Whether or not the reform action has been transformational or it's small bore, as you call it, in comparison to what Abe has been doing in Japan, do you think that there's been enough that's been done on the policy front to continue to excite investors? Well, I think that he's still in the honeymoon period because uh, the research that you're referring to, what that really shows is that within the first 12 to 18 months mm. of a new leader coming to office, generally investors are willing to give him the ben or her the benefit of the doubt. Right. So I think it's too early to really start asking that what's being done and what's not being done as yet. But I think also keep in mind that for the last uh, few months, I agree with you that Indian politics has played a dominant role mm. in driving this market. But there are many other factors at work which have driven the Indian market over mm. time. And one very significant factor has obviously been the state of global risk appetite sure. and of global liquidity. Mm. And I think that here there is something more concerning, in fact, at this stage. Because I know that in India we've been very much lost to the domestic political scene. But let's not forget that the Indian market over a period of time is still extremely linked to what happens globally. Never before in the history of uh, markets uh, have markets been so high five years after a uh, recession ended. Mm. So you have asset price inflation across the world and some of that asset price inflation I think has also helped India and Indian equities do well over the last five years. I agree that a, lo a lot of the factors have been domestic but some of the asset price inflation has also played a role I think here in lifting assets mm. uh, to a level which is somewhat disconnected from underlying economic reality. Right. So that's one big factor we have to keep in mind. Mm. And this sort of sort of when the Fed's going to hike interest rates, when that's going to change the global... When do you the Goldman Sachs view is the third <laughs> quarter of 2015? One of those concerns which is, which is sort of now beginning to bother the markets quite a mm. bit because the U.S. markets have really not made much headway over the past few months in this sort of tug of war which is going on between the bulls and the bears with a lot of sort of people concerned that when... Uh, interest rates do increase, it will play a massive role in changing the uh, investment landscape mm -hmm. because having such low interest rates has undoubtedly led to asset price inflation across the world. Mm. But what if the ECB were to come in with the stimulus? Would that, in a sense, counter some of the action that the Fed is likely to take? Yeah, I think that's possible, but it just is very hard to imagine the ECB being as aggressive as the Fed and was. Fed, yeah. And let's not forget that. Um, that asset prices today are much higher. Mm. So this is not five years ago when you have very low asset prices and you get a massive liquidity infusion mm. and you also have accelerating economic growth which sort of helps uh, the U.S. stock market go up and also sort of lifts some of the markets in its wake. Now as far as India is concerned, I think that the key for India really is this, uh, that on a relative basis India looks good because mm. it's one of the few emerging markets today which does not have any serious imbalances. Having said that, the problem with India I think today is that where it's hard to foresee anything going wrong from a crisis standpoint. I think the problem today is the fact that uh, growth expectations out of India have also been ratcheted up. Mm. You know, people are talking about uh, these linear cases now where growth will be five and a half now, going to six and a half, going to seven, seven. and everyone's debate is that will it go to eight or will it stop mm. at seven? Mm. But the trajectory for everyone seems very clear. Mm. And I get very concerned when the outlook is so universally optimistic. Mm. Uh, having said that, uh, we are still overweight India, and that's something which uh, 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 I'm sticking to. But after, 
I have to say that I'm nervously optimistic about India well, what makes at you this so stage. nervous? Because, you know, let's look at what's happening as far as the macroeconomy is concerned. You talked about some of the countries that have a current account deficit. We've significantly been able to curtail our current account deficit problem. The fiscal deficit issue has also been dealt with. Uh, well, you know, not completely, right. but at least it's under control at this point in time. The government seems to be saying the right things in terms of improving efficiency and so on and so forth. So what are you most nervous about? The fact that everybody else is so bullish or, yeah. or is there something in the structural story that's making you nervous? No, uh, as I said, that I'm still optimistic, but uh, my concern is that uh, currently I'm part of the herd, uh, that everyone uh, is optimistic on India from a portfolio standpoint, from portfolio management standpoint. That optimism hasn't yet filtered through to other constituencies. Because if you look at capital flows to India, outside of portfolio flows, which tend to get so much attention, yeah. other capital flows to India haven't really picked the up. The long-term money, the FDI. Well, I don't know about long-term, but yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, even cross-border bank lending, other sort of flows, those really haven't picked up to India, and they're a fraction of what they used to be uh, as a share of the economy mm. back in 2006, 2007. And why do you think that's the case? Because I think that uh, on those fronts, there are many other factors at play. In, you know, uh, to have a big jump in FDI requires so much of the reality on the ground to change. Uh, to require cross-border bank flows to pick up really requires the banks in the Western uh, capitals to be in much better shape than they are today to extend that kind of credit. So I think in India's case, the concern, as I said, is just about expectations. Uh, it's about no serious imbalance. If you look at the makeup of the market as well, yeah. it's interesting how this has changed in India uh, in the last few months. That the, uh, and it tells you about the nature of this economic recovery as well. Yeah. That it is really being led entirely by the consumer sector. Yeah. So, uh, so the optimism has to do with a lot of the consumer discretionary plays doing well. A lot of the high-frequency indicators are showing that it's really the consumer demand which is picking up. Mm. But if you look at the market even, if you look at the performance of the industrials, you look at the performance of uh, uh, the materials or some of the more sort of investment related plays, right. those have been fading. So this economic recovery so far is very much being led by the consumer in mm. India and the optimism which has come through after the election. Uh, but on the investment front, if you look at the guts of the market, it's yeah. not telling you as the, some big investment cycle here mm is going to begin. So what's your own sense about when we should see the CAPEX cycle turning around? Because, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. You talk to people, there's a big difference in mood and sentiment, but people are not putting cash to use just yet. They're still waiting uh, on the sidelines, sitting on the fence. Uh, what's your own sense about when we should expect the CAPEX cycle to begin? Well, I think some t uh, this entire uh, hope rally that we have had mm. and this optimism I think this is going to meet its judgment day, so to speak, next year. Okay. And this is the typical political cycle as well, if you look at other countries as well. Mm. Which is the, when a new leader comes to power, uh, in anticipation of that new leader, particularly if that leader has reformed credentials, the market ten, uh, tends to do well. And in the first year, mm. you have some lift in economic sentiment and actual economic activity as well, because of the positive feedback yeah. loop coming from the improved capital markets and the general improvement mm. in confidence in the mm. economy. So the first year tends to be that way. It's the second year where you really get this separation. In the interim, you don't really anticipate a sharp protracted correction. We might see a pullback, but you're saying that wait for the assessment of this government's performance in year two before investors really take a long call on India. Yes, that's right. I think that's what will happen. The immediate risk, I think, comes more from global factors. Yeah. I think that the risk in the next three to six months is more to do with global factors, which is the uh, and those global factors are. Is the Fed concern overdone? Because you know, when when we uh, when the whole QE winding down debate was going on, and there was you know huge outflows from the Indian markets, uh, anticipating that the Fed would actually act. But once the winding down has taken place in an orderly fashion, it's systematic, uh, it's anticipated, it's expected. We actually haven't seen too much of a dramatic decline in emerging markets, particularly India. Well, I think that... Uh, if anything, we, we've actually done better. Uh, yes, but I think that in the last few weeks, as those concerns have begun to rise again, we have again seen a, a sense of nervousness come through. Because this, the extent of which these markets across the world uh, and mainly in the U.S., of course, but uh, across the world have benefited from uh, uh, the low interest rate regime yeah. is enormous. Mm -hmm. So it is a big paradigm shift whenever uh, interest rates will go up. So I do feel that in the next three to six months, uh, the more immediate risk for India comes from global factors. Mm -hmm. 
And then after that, it really, I think, will swing back to focusing, okay, that we have seen this consumer-led recovery. Is this going to now translate into a broad-based recovery involving the investment cycle or not? And the second year, investors, I think, will be a lot more impatient uh, with what's going on. I think currently they're willing to give the government the benefit of the doubt. That right. They're taking their time. They're getting their uh, act in place. They're understanding the situation. But the second year, the impatience really rises. Well, we'll take a quick break and continue our conversation with Richard Sharma.